Hi, everyone. My name is San Choi. I am the founder of Rough Roll Academy, which is a small business operated in Los Angeles, California. And just like every dog, I like to provide low cost, affordable solutions for the everyday person. Um, this topic that we're going to be discussing today is something that is very near and dear to my heart because I know that this is something that not only do I face challenges with on a day-to-day -day basis with my own dogs and some client dogs, but also with all the all the people that we have here today and the people that will be listening. So this is a very um, passionate topic that I really enjoy talking about. So I look forward to sharing with this with you. And without further ado, we'll get things started. Okay, so. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, welcome. So again, my name is San. I am a KPA CPT, um, a Karen Pryor's certified training partner, and um, I hope to enrich you guys with things that we can really help us be more thoughtful of to really build a skill set of. And I think those skills and sometimes when we're outside, it feels like we're surviving. We gotta make sure that our dogs are okay and that we're okay as a team. That um, I, I came up with some solutions, some skills that we can really think about approaching life to make things a little bit more easier. Um, these can be things that uh, are mindsets and also things that we do actively uh, physically to practice with our dogs. Okay, so who's this for? I want to say this webinar is for the everyday person, whether you're very young, a uh, man or a female, uh, old, or uh, regardless of what you have your dog, I feel like there are so many instances that we have reactivity that really makes life very difficult for not only us, but also with our dogs. And today we're going to be talking about what we can do to really help each other out with that. Um, also specifically, this is very relevant to puppies. Um, any dogs at, over the, the age of a year old, they tend to go through what is called a second fear period and they can be more aware about their surroundings. Things that were scary before can be more concerning. So um, especially for our younger puppies that are transitioning to adulthood, this is, uh, this is also to you as well. So I'd like to start off with a definition. Um, this is just your standard definition. I thought I'd look up what a companion is. And uh, one of the most lovely uh, definitions is uh, one of a pair of things intended to complement with each other. And I feel like as people, we come into our lives with dogs to spend a life together and to really enjoy each other's times. And I feel the, the process of matching together and how we can best support each other can be the very best medicine when it comes to what we deal with the outside world, really focusing back to what it means to enjoy our time in a relationship with our dog and uh, internalizing that, those things, those qualities, and those can be skills, some things that we'll be, talk, be talking about to really just make sure that we can support our dogs as as well as them supporting us. So even though reactivity can be, it feels like we're centering that mindset on what the dog is doing. I feel like there is a greater impact of how our dog, how we feel while our dogs are going through their emotions. So uh, we'll talk about things such as how can we find ways to complement each other, right? Um, what can we do to better understand our dogs and for our dogs to better understand us? Um, and what can we do to best match with our dog? A lot, I think a lot of things in terms of understanding how dogs learn and how is their, is their world set up and why would they behave the way they are, they are because of that setup um, really helps us to understand what we can do to really make that adjustment uh, along uh, life just so it's a little bit easier for, for them to navigate and to be at their best. I think it's really important that um, when I say survival, I, I, I take this as a, as a little uh, game five approach. Uh, think of it as a game and think of the, the skills that you improve on as ways that you can level up and really build your skills to, to uh, proceed a game along with your dog. And for that game to be something that um, you rely with uh, on with your teammate, which is your dog. So I'm, I'm a huge proponent of, of teamwork and we'll explore more of what that looks like in a moment. So I came up with eight skills 
um, things that I find that would be very helpful to the everyday person. And um, those things can be developing a new perspective. There's a lot of things that when we look at face value at how, what our dogs are behaving, we might come to certain assumptions or certain ways of thinking. And what do I like to start off with, with this uh, topic is really diving into perspectives that can really make our lives a little bit easier and also for our dogs. Um, decompressing, really finding ways to going back to enjoying our dog. Um, it's gonna be a reoccurring theme of how we can recover or even uh, excel from where we are in terms of our, our, our reactivity journey. Just finding ways to enjoy ourselves and for our dogs to enjoy themselves as well. We're gonna be quickly talking about health and how that can affect behavior. Um, just as important as health, we want to make sure that our dogs are, are at their very best and discussing things such as animal welfare is so important to behavior. So we'll be talking about that as well as, and as well as that, we'll be discussing uh, how dogs specific learn, specifically learn and um, we'll learn about the ABCs of that or the one, two, threes of how that um, occurs. And you might find that you have some similarities along with your dog as well. We'll learn how behavior change works. So in order to get to where we want to get to, we want to understand a roadmap of how this stuff really occurs. And we'll be exploring that. And also some practical measures such as um, helping our dogs succeed by limiting those opportunities where they do react. Um, and also finding some engaging ways for them to do things that they do enjoy. We're also going to be talking about something called reinforcement history, which is something that really drives um, the reasons for our dogs to pick an alternative uh, thing to do when, whenever they're faced with a challenge, such as a, a dog on the street, um, and, and how our training can really build up that reinforcement history as a way to support our, our survival game. And lastly, but um, just equally as important as every other topic is body language. So by learning how to read our dog's body language or what we'll learn more about uh, specifically called emotional signals um, really gives us a general clue or an insight of how our dogs are feeling and also how we can be there to support our dogs. Um, and we'll go through that in a moment. Okay, great. So developing a new perspective. I taught, I came up with seven things that I think that are very uh, compelling through my experience of working with dogs and um, helping out people. And I hope this can really help you out as well. I'd like to start with the first one. Uh, my, my mentor, uh, my KPA mentor, she always mentions to make things fun or, or make things, make it stop. And I think that should be at the core root of our training um, for us to have fun with our dog and also when our dogs are training especially in a context where they might see something scary or stressful or really exciting we want to make sure that they're enjoying the moment of training and sometimes when the fun stops this is where our dogs might venture off to being more stressed and we know through uh, science and also research that our dogs don't start stop to think actually uh, through, through the increasing amount of stress. So the best learning does happen when our dogs are having fun, we're really enjoying ourselves. And just like your dogs, I feel like we're the same way. So a great way to check if um, when you're in a training session and if that's a good place for you guys to train is, um, is it fun for you guys? Is it easy for you guys to do the training? Is, are things simple and, and easy to process? Um, those, if, if the answer is yes, most likely that is a great place for uh, us to start training. And if they aren't, that might be a way for us to monitor that we might need to make the training a little bit more easier for us to see that success when we continue to progress. Um, training should be really relaxing uh, for us and our dogs. Um, I think it should be another activity. Think of just this survival game as this way of interacting with your dog, learning to connect and to achieve something as a team. And um, I think being able to, to have that kind of fun is really exciting. Um, working with your dog uh, one step at a time, just like how you would work with yourself one step at a time when you're learning something new is very, very important. So sometimes we might think of getting to a goal of walking on a loose leash and our dog passing a dog. And sometimes there are some steps to take before we get there. And the, the important thing about being a good teammate is to really go along that progression with your teammate and to, to really um, be there for them. 
something that's also really important and something that I really struggled with when I started getting into training was um, learning that learning that and understanding and coming to terms that learning is not just the one straight path to my goal. Sometimes it can be full of ups and downs, but the great thing is once we have this mindset and these skills built in, we keep on an upwards trajectory towards where we want to go, even though there are those peaks and valleys. So I say uh, when things are tough, make them, make them fun again. And sometimes that could mean uh, just taking a break from training for you and, and also your dog as well. Uh, embarking on your reactive training as, as something that you, you and your dog do together should be another way that we can hope to find more fulfillment and uh, meaning behind the things that we do. Look at it as, um, as, a, as a game or, or, or some sort of accomplishment that you can do with your dog, such as maybe like um, doing some sort of um, agility work, but in a sense for reactivity, really wear those successes, those little successes as medals of, of, of what you've accomplished with your dog from, you know, just passing it by a dog from 50 feet, and then maybe at 40 feet or 30 feet, so on and so forth, really honor those moments because they're so important to you to uh, just keeping things sustainable and, and great for you guys. And, um, and I think that leads to the last point, which is just to enjoy your growth with your dog. Um, Learning things can be a challenge, but to do things with the ones that we love makes uh, makes it all worthwhile, really. And I think that's another way to just, again, to make things fun or, or kind of um, pivot if um, they aren't as fun. So it leads to our second um, skill, which is decompression, right? Um, before we get into the nitty gritty of like learning about dogs, I want to make sure that we, we center this this talk around us, how we feel on a day-to-day -day basis, just along with our dog. So uh, this is a rather simple one, but something I think is just as powerful as any other thing, such as reading body language, is to make sure that we're continuing to, to have uh, reinforcers in our own life or things that we, we enjoy. So um, if your dog enjoys doing, um, if you, in, sorry, if, if you enjoy um, gardening and, and, and building um, cars, I think it's a great place for us to to do those things along with our dog. It's it's a nice to have those outlets uh, with those uh, activities that are stressful in our life. So just making sure that we're taking care of ourselves is really helpful, and to really go back to those moments, especially when things get tough. Um, there's life ebbs and flows, just like our learning with our dog. And I think it's important for us to fit in those moments of um, upholding the thing, why we enjoy life so much as we kind of go through a, a trying time. Um, this also applies to our dogs. Um, I think doing more things that dogs love doing, such as getting into more enrichments and doing more things that dogs love to do naturally, Sometimes that can mean just being at a park with no dogs, no, no nothing, just a long line and just having them have an opportunity to sniff and enjoy themselves is just as important for us um, in our reactivity journey as it is to them in terms of their own well-being. And by just going back to helping our dogs enjoy themselves, it brings their mood up. And, in, and, if, and if you're a person that enjoys certain activities and if you can think about those activities, think about how, how much of that joy that you get from that. And sometimes that can just uplift you so much. And I feel that that's the same way for their dogs. And many times with dogs with reactivity, they, they may be more lacking in the, in the category of being able to do things that they enjoy doing. So just as much as you enjoy your time um, doing the things that you love, uh, be sure to also share those activities with your dogs. Find things that you guys have middle ground in. And I think that's where companionship and coming together really uh, does help, right? In terms of uh, enjoying our time together. So um, building um, camaraderie with our dogs also can mean just like laying there and just being on the ground and just um, spooning if your dog is a, is a touchy-feely dog or just uh, being at, at a park or just just being somewhere that you both are enjoying a beautiful landscape. I think that's something that we can, uh, that is so important, especially when there are those peaks and valleys, especially with reactivity where there can be so much range of behavior on what our dogs can offer. So finding a lot of peace in, in going through that by having a lot of fun things to do is again, so important. Uh, step three. So before we even start training, I think it's a really good idea to make sure that our dogs are at their very best uh, in their health. And I think this goes the same way for us as well. So if you're someone that's injured, uh, make sure that um, 
and take care of yourself just like as as you would with an injured dog and many times um, health can be an underlying issue that affects behavior which is one reason why we want to make sure that we rule out any um, external health conditions just so when we do start with training we do know that our dogs are at their very best and doing going back to the previous step of making sure that our dogs have plenty of things that they love to do being at their very best is the greatest solution to having the best start with your training. Um, dogs should not train. In, uh, dogs in pain should not train. Uh, should not train. And I think that is so important to to consider uh, when there's discomfort. I think it's that's a signal from our dog that they need a little bit of help from us. And sometimes that help can be just to take a break and to acknowledge that they they need that moment or they need a few weeks sometimes to recover from an injury if that's the case. And and also, yeah, just going back to the original concern um, point, the the welfare and health of your dog just really sets up everything moving on forward for for success. So, do consider health when you're along this journey. As important as health is, um, the topic of animal welfare is just as important. Um, we have um, the five freedoms by Dr. Roger Campbell. Um, and what he suggests is that every animal should have these access to these five freedoms to, to be uh, the most um, uh, prime version of, of who they are as an individual. And I think as we're going through these things, it's also important to think about this in a lens of how um, we can do this for ourselves too. And think of these five freedoms as we go through with our dogs, through what our dogs may experience. And I think uh, being a teammate is also about empathy and really understanding where our dogs can be coming from. And uh, many times in our everyday um, uh, culture, it's very common for dogs to not have these freedoms advocated, which can be another reason why we might see um, more fear or aggressive related behaviors, uh, more stress occurring because of the lack of these freedoms. So just as important as it is to have your own freedoms to enjoy the life that you want to enjoy, I think our dogs should deserve the same respect. And I feel like once we can understand that and being that teammate that can recognize that our dog may need that, that help from us to really support them in these needs, I think we can be that much more, more closer to having our dog be at their very best, which will just only set us up for success when we do um, start with our training. So um, one of the five freedoms talks about uh, being um, free from hunger and thirst. Uh, we want to make sure that our dogs just have access to food and water. Um, and when we're training our dogs, I think it's so important that our, our dogs are training when they have eaten or they have their, 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 their um, thirst is quenched. Um, it is uncomfortable to, to be hungry and it's also uncomfortable to be thirsty. So something to consider whenever you're in a training session or when you're outside, especially when you're outside, because it does get hot, to have those uh, opportunities for your dog to, um, to at least get the water and um, before doing training, make sure that they have meals. Um, we shouldn't use uh, food as a way to strengthen a more strong behavior. We don't want our dogs to be um, um, deprived of food as, as a way to train. So I think that first point really is also related to the training realm, as well as to the welfare, welfare, welfare realm of my dog. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't really say that too well. Um, second freedom. Um, this one is going to be really related to training, but um, freeing our dog from discomfort. A lot of the environments, conditions in our everyday life has caused our dogs some discomfort. And a lot of that discomfort can impact our, our dog's overall welfare. So by, by limiting those opportunities where our dogs get upset when they see certain triggers that they respond to, whether that be people or dogs or, or objects, um, really is a great place to start. Um, this, this touches up on a point of managing our environment where we can set our animal up to have an environment that as, is as least uh, comfortable as possible. It's probably impossible to make the environment completely um, so comfortable that our dogs are a little bit literally living in a bubble, but I think having the forethought to do so is just is, is so important. Um, freeing ourselves uh, for our dogs from uh, pain, injury, or disease. And this goes back to our, our previous slide of just making sure our dog's health is at their best. Um, the freedoms to express natural behaviors. So our dogs love to sniff. Our dogs love to, to, um, 
to chew on things. They love to rip. They love to forage, um, search for food. So uh, by providing a lot of these accesses to these natural behaviors, our dogs can be at their best, just like as if we, uh, let's say if we always love the reading, right? Um, it's important that we continue to express these natural behaviors that we, we will just want to do. And let's say you're, if you're an avid reader and you just aren't able to read one day, it's it can be such a, um, and sometimes even finding an alternative might not give you that same sync um, quenched in, in what you enjoy out of that activity um, opposed to just having that, right? So just providing more of that to our animals is just so incredibly important. Um, and freedom from fear and distress. Uh, and I think that's one of, the, at, at the epicenter of why certain dogs will be reactive. It's really because they they aren't free from the fear and distress and that's really impacting their overall welfare. So if there's things that we can do to mitigate that, to reduce that, it's only going to help our dogs out and also help out our overall training progress of getting to our goal. Um, quick little fun slide, but um, it's just about having more fun and less stress. So teaching our dogs can be helpful. Uh, to building new feelings with old triggers. So being able to have fun with our dog is a great place to start. And when we start to train our dog, and let's say we're working on an attention behavior around uh, a dog that they're uncomfortable with, just really uh, working at a comfortable distance around that dog could develop new feelings for your dog, where in previous cases where a dog has seen a dog and they've had all these upset experiences, can start to be on the mend to create these new feelings that, hey, that dog that I was, I was upset about uh, is not so bad. And what we can do is make sure that our dogs are having fun with the process of training. Uh, and maybe that could mean just starting really far away from, from those triggers. So it's it's easy for our dogs to get into those training, um, to really enjoy those trainings and, and start to develop those positive experiences. And just like as we do with training and, and looking at welfare, uh, we're doing our best to provide our dogs as much opportunities to make sure that they're having fun. And when we are able to provide more reinforcers or things that our dogs enjoy, it's only going to help us um, have a dog that's going to be able to respond to stress really well. And also a dog that is at their very best to, to respond in certain situations. Um, and as long as we stay away from those adversities as well as we can, we'll be on a mend towards where we're going to. But I think a lot of the peaks and valleys of our learning can be reduced when we start uh, monitoring our environment where we can limit him as many instances of those adverses or those stressful situations occurring and, and really influence the environment by providing more opportunities to have fun, more opportunities to do training. And also uh, with training being there for our dog to create a new feeling, they will again, start to be on that mend again. Um, so step five um, or skill five is really about teaching our dog how, um, well, not teaching our dog, teaching ourselves. Sorry about, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Um, learning about how our dogs understand and perceive the world. And um, this slide entitles the ABCs of really how they learn. And it's literally the ABC. So what ABC actually stands for is if you can look at the middle of the screen where the dogs are looking, um, antecedent is actually um, the events or the action or the circumstance that occurs before the behavior. Um, this is what usually sets up our dog to uh, want to behave. And what short falls shortly after that, if you look on to the, the left side of the dogs, there's a little uh, circular icon over here. But as we move from antecedent, we go into the behavior that our dogs offer. And soon after what happens is our dogs receive some sort of consequence or C or a general outcome that maintains the behavior. And uh, this couldn't be our dog receiving a treat for a sitting, just kind of like what these two dogs are doing. Um, so in this case, uh, the antecedent is the, the person holding out the food, right? The, the hand that has the food, that is the event that's occurring before the behavior usually. And what will typically happen is the dogs will, will sit and, and wait for them, wait for the food. And then eventually they will get the, the treats as a way. Um, and what happens when they do get the treats is they're able to get some something that they enjoy from doing that, um, that behavior. And that's how we can maintain skills. Uh, 
usually with positive reinforcement, um, our dogs learn through consequences. So uh, consequences really drive the behavior of our dogs. So the more that our dogs have these consequences happen, the more stronger this, this does, <clears throat> the, the more likely that a, a behavior can occur. So this can really work for us in the context of um, our dog um, maybe paying and learning to pay attention to us instead of worrying about the dog. But it can also go against us in ways where if our dogs see a, do a barking dog, our dog learns to bark and eventually they learn to continue barking because they learn the other dog goes away, right? In, in a circumstance with um, our dog responding with barking by seeing another dog, um, what the consequence in that situation is, is actually when a dog actually moves away. Um, the safety that our dogs feel when the dog is not there actually maintains those behaviors. So, um, so if you notice that your dogs are getting more intense and they're, they're barking more often, chances are we might um, be accidentally uh, uh, maintaining these behaviors. And so once we equip ourselves with learning how dogs learn, we can start to re-engineer the environment in ways that we can set up what we would like to happen, set up the, the behaviors that we intend by being very deliberate on how we set up antecedents or, or how the, the learning condition is, is, is being established. And also doing our, our, our due diligence of being able to provide that outcome that they enjoy. And so, so important. So, excuse me, here is an example of uh, ABC with the uh, reactivity. So just like what we talked about earlier, usually um, antecedents are, are not just, it's not just about the dog. I think it's important to look at the whole picture. So if you can, if you see antecedent, I've, I've jot down that it's when the brown dog, usually the, 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 the learning dog sees uh, another dog staring back at them. Um, they're going to be more likely to, to bark and lunge. Some things that are also a part of the environments that also can really uh, trigger our dogs to, to barking is things such as being on a, on a short line. So one thing that you might see is the, the white and brown dog is on a very short line with the leash is tight. Um, that tightness of the leash can also be another antecedent condition that sets up the behavior of the bark and lunge. Um, as well as uh, being on a flat collar. Maybe there's certain equipment that our dogs are really used to. And sometimes if they feel certain sensations around those areas, especially in the context of maybe seeing a dog and our dog has probably learned that it's very comfortable to be in those situations, just the sheer feeling can really trigger our dogs into those situations, right? And um, the common thing is after dogs bark, usually owners either are quick to move away or, or we make a lot of noise and then, uh, and then we're able to go our separate ways. And sometimes that's what maintains the behavior, which is just our dog being able to, to receive the outcome of being safe. And I think if we understand why our dogs might behave, be behaving the, the, the way that they are in terms of um, their need to, to be free from that discomfort, um, really gives us some pieces to really uh, start working with if, let's say, if our dogs are stressful and stressed in these conditions. Going back to uh, our five freedoms, it's, it's so important when we're working with training to make sure that our, we're freeing our dogs from discomfort when they're actually around other dogs. And um, usually when there's a, there's a dog like the, the brown and white dog, um, there is probably not too much learning happening at all just because it's really not fun for them. So um, I think a good rule of thumb, especially when we're dealing with reactivity, is to really set up the environment where we uh, might not be setting up an antecedent um, that, is, that will prompt things that we want to change. So uh, make sure, making sure things such as walking our dogs without... Um, dogs being too close, um, walking them on a, on a long line, maybe switching our dog into a walking harness if they've learned to pull on a, a flat collar. Those can be great alternatives to start changing the antecedent. And even those subtle changes can be a great way for our dogs to develop new feelings and new associations, and also possibly new skills along with the, the, those ante other antecedents, um, such as like the their walking equipment. Um, and I think that, that can really help us, especially when we um, look back into uh, the five freedoms as our, our sort of template to literally guide us through like if this is the right situation. And just like when, when my mentor Nan says, if it's, if it's not fun, we can, we can always make it stop and we can always recess things and kind of come back when uh, we have more of a clear uh, idea of how we can approach this. 
So I'd like to give other uh, ABC examples to just give you guys more real life contexts. So I, sometimes um, I think learning by example is really helpful. This dog is, um, um, she's a 10 month old Sheltie, um, very strong hurting behaviors, uh, very strong barking behaviors. Uh, whenever she sees dogs on uh, or any animal on TV, she will uh, bark at them. And one thing that we're doing um, our job in due diligence, due diligence in is um, trying to help her by setting up the antecedent where it's, she's more likely to respond in alternative behaviors. So uh, one thing we, we decided to do was we, we taught Sochi how to lay down on, on her rug and some, and since we trained his behavior quite well, when she does see dogs and she is laying down, uh, we were able to start developing those new uh, feelings with the, um, with the TV based off of her new skill set. And I think what we can do is um, find ways to provide our dogs a, an antecedent that works for them. And before we even worked with the TV on, uh, we had to make sure that um, the TV was off as a way to just have some sort of uh, way to get things started. So going back to th making things simple, uh, Sochi uh, really loves um, praise. She loves attentions and, uh, and also tasty snacks. So those are things that we were able to provide her as a consequence to maintain her behavior of laying down on the mat. Another example is um, what we see over here. So here uh, we see a, a handler is uh, standing near a dog at, at a park. So that's me, like that's where the where the black dogs are, are facing towards. And one thing that these dogs have learned when they're facing people is that um, they get reinforcement or things that they enjoy like tasty snacks if they learn to offer looking or, or um, sitting behaviors and before we got to this um, this this beautiful picture that took literally months to get to, um, a little backstory on on Goddard. He is a he is a very very reactive dog. So this is a dog that I had I worked with for any anywhere from six to eight months, and we started probably over two hundred feet away. Like it was so concerning to him that when he even saw a dog move within that that distance, that it was very troubling for him. But one thing he learned was as he was able to provide more of those attention and sitting skills and other skills that we helped um, uh, teach Gutter to relax, we were able to gradually enclose that distance. So um, I think it is possible for our dogs to really be at a place where they, they can offer more um, calmer behaviors and a great place to get there is really starting off somewhere that they can be comfortable in. But um, that's why I mentioned that our our uh, behavior journey, it can be full of ups and downs. It, it can be a long road. And depending on how intense your dogs can be, the best thing we can do is just really aim to work with them one step at a time. Um, I Did I know how when Goddard would would have turned around and started to um, start to be even in a place where that he wanted to be near a dog? Um, I, I didn't. And one thing I did know was as long as be, I was a good teammate towards Goddard, I was really fulfilling his needs as a, as a canine by advocating for those five freedoms and really gradually working with him step by step. Here, can, can we practice some training skills when you're 200 feet, 250 feet away instead of 200 feet? And then really inching or, and, and just gradually working with him. Uh, and slowly but surely, one thing we were able to do is make the, the environment really fun for him where he has access to all these things that he enjoys. And over time, he started associating these things with uh, with the other black dog you see here. Um, his name's Shadow, and he's one of the dogs that I, I bring to, to help with reactivity. And um, it's it's just a great journey that I, I think it's really fulfilling once we get to the point where we're, we're seeing a lot of success. But for those that are still in the midst of that journey, just just keep enjoying your time with your dog, find ways to decompress and really um, consider some of the things that we've been talking about. But um, it is it is possible as long as um, uh, we we have a thoughtful and nice to, uh, thoughtfulness to be good teammates to our dogs and also to you know, take things um, one step at a time. So right now we're gonna be learning about how behavior change works. <clears throat> And usually uh, it is a long road. So sometimes uh, what can be helpful is as we're working through this to really start 
thinking about uh, what it's like for our dogs to change in their behavior. Uh, from a barking dog to a not, not barking dog can mean uh, just our dog learning to stand there. Um, these skills, and uh, what can be called replacement skills, are very beneficial to really helping our dogs have an alternative solution when they do feel stressed. So in order for that behavior change to occur, we want to do our due diligence of really teaching our dogs the concept of those replacement skills and what they really look like. Um, a great place to really get those skills as strong as we can to the point where, where our dogs can really rely on them when they're, out, when they're outside or near dogs or near things that are stressful is really providing plenty of practice in building these strong behaviors and applying um, these practices and how we have our dogs to move away from a dog, maybe practice recall when they do see a dog and really having that alternative interaction with, with our part, with the environment that they're in uh, as a way for us to, to, to be able to give our dogs a chance to understand, hey, that this skill really, really works very well for them. Um, uh, one big tip is to make training really easy. Um, so at every stage, I think it's a great goal once at each step to make training as easy as possible. And so if we start with something that's easy for our dogs and we could progressively work with them and we start just changing little pieces at a time. So this can be working with um, with a reactive dog with uh, a trigger at um, at 50 feet away. And then we gradually move on to 45 feet. And then maybe if that's a little bit more simple, uh, what I can do is go back to something that's really easy, maybe going back to 47 feet and then maybe venturing off to uh 40, 43 feet. It's, it's probably harder to gauge those specific numbers, but really making the training easy by making sure that we, that the changes that we have our dogs go through when they're going to reactivity training are so small that it's, it's very easy for them to, to accomplish these things. But as we make training more easy, things that get more difficult become easy. And I think that's a great place to help our dogs succeed. So um, usually when things are easy, we're having a lot of fun. We're enjoying ourselves. Um, there, there's a, there's a sense of fun that we're having. And I think those are good barometers to have when we're training our dogs and really, um, seeking behavior change. Okay. So step number seven, skill number seven is to, um, really do our best to prevent the rehearsal of some of the behaviors that we do or see our dogs perform. Um, just like as we can train intended skills for our dogs to have some sort of coping mechanism to move away from things that are scary. We want to make sure that we're supplementing that with an environment where they're not able to practice these behaviors. And usually with reactive dogs, because their, their well-being is so greatly impacted to those experiences, managing our dog is only the, a, a very kind and humane thing that we can be doing for our dogs. So it's, uh, it's a great place to um, start with our training. Um, uh, making sure that our dogs are healthy, uh, making sure that they have uh, a good setup in management where they're not able to practice the undesirable behavior really sets us up for them to, to be successful. Uh, replacing our dog needs to do something uh, with things that are appropriate and are simple for them is a great solution to training. Um, so I have a few examples of what we can do in terms of managing behavior. So let's say if your dog is counter surfing, if we are simply able to have some sort of an enrichment mat where they can learn to forage and enjoy being on the ground, that's a simple way for our dogs to do things that are, are, are enjoyable for them that also work for us. And I feel like management uh, can be challenging if we may ask our dog to do too much. So one thing that it really helps to just set us up for success is just by keeping things simple. Um, can our dogs just eat somewhere else instead of eating something possibly upon encounter? Um, other things such as, um, let's, let's say if you guys have mail delivery, mail delivery carriers, being able to have a drop-in box that's away from the door, uh, I think that's a great way to set up the antecedents of making sure that our dogs, um, if they, they develop the condition that when they hear the mailman coming towards the front door to bark, we can redirect our where our mailman's path of delivery is. And I think that's a great way to, to support our dog to limit the rehearsal of behaviors and the stresses that can happen from, from that reactivity. Um, 
for potty training for our puppies, limiting the water um, after a certain time would be a great way to possibly prevent some uh, midnight potty accidents. So being able to monitor um, the, the limitation of water, I think that's that's another way we, we can um, have a good track of not having our dogs um, potty at, at nighttime. So sometimes just being able, just leaving the water open um, can be um, something that can set us up for our, for our dog to end up peeing at night and eventually for us to wake up in the middle of the night to clean that up. So monitoring um, just the, um, uh, managing water, I think that can be another great way to, to look at management. Um, avoiding popular times to walk and, and locations. I think this is so key, especially when we're in our beginning stages of uh, getting on to the mend of recovering with our dog. So those are, those are just some examples. I've left a behavior log uh, where you guys can document any sorts of uh, behaviors that are happening that are undesirable. One thing that's really important is to gather behavior data. So in, our, in order for us to have a good management strategy, sometimes it's important for us to see where these behaviors are happening and, and under what conditions or what antecedents. And by having a behavior log, I think that's a great place for us to start keeping track and possibly seeing some trends of uh, behavior that's happening for us to make more adjustments. Uh, so I left uh, a link for you guys with the behavior log, and I would highly encourage you guys to use it as a way to help you um, figure out what's going on at what times and what we can do to make some changes. Okay, so uh, step number eight is to fill up uh, the bank, really. Um, so one thing with with dogs with reactivity, we're trying to find an alternative for them to learn to feel safe with the world again, for them to learn that things aren't so so um, scary or so stimulating. And sometimes for that to happen, we want to develop a very strong uh, behavior behavior repertoire um, or, or skills that our dogs can do instead of the thing that we don't want them to do. So we talked about uh, replacement skills as it can be our dogs just looking at us or looking away from dogs, but making sure whatever that replacement skill you decide to teach and to teach your dog to, for that to um, have plenty of opportunity to, to flourish. So some things that we can do to help our dog do this is, um, is to get more fun uh, with to have more fun with the re with having more reinforcers. So what this can mean is having more access to to things that they do enjoy. So if it's if it's them uh, offering looking away from a dog, let's provide them something fun to do right after. If our dogs really love to play, I think that's a great way to introduce that. Um, other things can be reinforcing naturally offered behaviors. So things that our dogs are doing on a day-to-day -day basis, you might find that uh, your dog will naturally just learn to stand there. And I think that's a great skill to reinforce because usually typically before do reactive dogs bark, they're probably just standing and watching dogs. So being able to notice simple things like that are happening every day and letting our dog know that, hey, this works really well. Hey, this works really well by giving them those reinforcers and making sure they're having fun when they're doing the behavior is a really good place to, um, to, to build some uh, strong reinforcement history. So uh, it's easier for them to make that choice of responding to that alternative behavior when uh, they are uh, at the face of a trigger. Uh, building a uh, rich reinforcement history is so important. Uh, letting them know this works everywhere. This works at home. This works in the backyard. This works when dogs are really far away. This, dogs, this works when dogs are moderately close. This works when dogs are really, really close. Um, are things that we should make sure that um, our dogs have plenty of understanding of before we ask our dogs to do something that they might not be capable of. So going back to um, working in step by step with our dogs, I think it's really important to make sure that they learn that every that the replacement skill works everywhere, but also for that to happen progressively. So as your dogs are moving towards building that that uh, reinforcement history of of that skill working really well for them, being able to um, dial things back and make things easy. And as our dog's skill set expands, we can open it up to having them do uh, more, more of the same behaviors in, in different, different circumstances.
And one thing we can also incorporate is um, these, these gradual changes, right? From just starting with things that are really simple. And over time, you'll, you'll soon to realize that once we take things really slowly and simply and gradually, our dog's comfort levels expand because we're able to fill that reinforcement history or that um, of that bank of that, that behavior working really well. I think when we, when I mentioned, when I picked this um, title for this slide, I, I like to say bank because it's not only just a bank of currency, but it's also a bank of trust. Um, our bank of bank where our dogs understand that they can get things that they enjoy and also uh, things that they realize that we're, we're adding more trust into every single time uh, they, they offer that replacement behavior. And also learning that um, we can really help them by empowering and reinforcing their own choices that they, they do make on their own. Um, so making sure that we empower them by, by providing those reinforcers um, really is a great place to maintain really good behavior. Um, short training sessions are great. And I think, especially when we're on the walk, if it's just adding in one trial of your dog, just looking away from the dog and moving on, I think that's a great place to start and um, a great place to make things a little bit simple for our dogs. Um, and as we are introducing uh, triggers into the environment, as we're building reinforcement history, it's important to attenuate those triggers, making sure that um, the intensity of the trigger only proceeds uh, based off of our dog's comfort level. So one of our last skills, but just as important as everything else is uh, body language, making sure that our dogs, um, uh, oh, sorry, sorry about that. So, uh oh trying to like move stuff, but I can't see. Okay, um, so with body language, it's important to note that um, what, we're look, what we're talking about when we're talking about body language is emotional signals. Um, so emotional signals are actually instinctive expressions our dogs have um, that are feeling internally that are expressed outwardly. And sometimes they might not be direct ways that our dogs are communicating with, with us or with the world, but it provides our, us a chance to really, um, really calculate how, how our dogs are feeling and how uh, we can best support them. So reading body language is a great place um, to help us monitor um, what pacing we should have when we're training our dogs uh, based on our dog's comfort level and which can be determined by our dog's body language. Uh, it really gives us a place that we can preserve our dog's uh, welfare and really make sure that they're, they're able to get as much out of the, the training as possible by making sure that they're, they're feeling as um, happy about the situation. And uh, so by reading our own, bio, our dog's body language, it really helps us to make sure that we're in the right um, training setup or the right uh, conditions that help promote the behaviors that we want to see. So some Body language signals at a glance uh, when our dogs are happy, they can be very different for every dog across the board. I like to say um, dogs are very much individuals, uh, just like as we are. And uh, the way that our dogs, your dog relaxes may be different from, from how my dog or the next dog. But one thing that I find helpful is taking beautiful pictures of when dogs are happy. Um, so whenever you see your dogs offer any of the, the following body language that you might see, maybe a, it's a loose body or soft eyes, kind of like what you see with all three of these dogs. You can see that there's a certain softness to their eyes. You can also notice that their carriage, uh, ear carriage is very natural to where they usually hold themselves to. <clears throat> and that is, um, that is also a sign that our dogs are relaxed. Happy dogs also have open mouths. Usually it's, it's a sign that they're very happy. Um, another thing to very note, a uh, more subtle one is um, stable posture. So how, how much weight our dogs have on each of their, their limbs really tell us how comfortable they are. So just think of your dog just, just staring at you when you're holding a piece of cheese. Usually their, 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 their weight is pretty centered. Um, it's kind of something like you see with the dog in the middle standing on on the table. Um, his, his weight is really balanced just, just as much as um, the, the, uh, the Australian Shepherd is. You can see like there's, there's even weight on each of the limbs and that's also a great indication that our dogs are feeling very relaxed. Um, sometimes our dogs can be seeking eye contact, kind of something like what the dogs are doing over here. Um, 
things to note is normal breathing patterns, literally getting to know how your dog breathes is really helpful. Um, and sometimes being able to note that can also give us really helpful clues when we go out to the outside world and some of those breathing patterns change. So little things of just noticing um, the rhythm of how our dogs breathe can really give us uh, more context of um, how they are um, interpreting the environment. So if uh, our dogs are really comfortable, most in the cases you might not see too much change in their breathing, um, their the weights are pretty balanced. They're probably not going to move too much, um, or if they are moving, they'll they'll be very loose and bouncy. So those are really good things to note. It's helpful to maybe just take a picture of your dog and um, and try to find opportunities where your dog really looks really happy in in your eyes. And then going back um, to maybe the sliding and going side by side with some of the um, the signals. Um, can really be a good place for us to really key in on what we can strive for when our dogs are working outside with, with stressors or with triggers. We want to make sure that our dogs um, are feeling good about themselves. And it's important to consider body language because it really helps us to understand um, if our dogs are really relaxed and if they're doing really well, usually with dogs that are offering relaxing behaviors, I know that things are going really well. And it, it, it's also a signal from them that um, we can keep moving forward. So going back to being a good teammate, reading our dog's body language is so, so, so important. And I think it's also important to look at uh, body language as a whole. Um, it's important to consider that um, each piece of our dog's body language is its own independent piece that that puts together the greater picture. So it's important to read those things uh, at a glance, at a, at a full scope as well. Um, and uh, just by noting those things, we can notice when our dogs are relaxed or, or they're treading towards building stress or even uh, building so much stress that they're more likely to bite. So uh, body language is also a great place for us to learn how to to safely train our dogs. I think that's such a priority, especially, especially if uh, the reactivity is more on the, the aggressive uh, realm of things. So being able to detect stress and also to know what that looks like and, 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 and seeing what we can do with our dog when we our dogs are stressed. So we're gonna be talking about some, some of those stress factors. Um, something that, that's really important to note is uh, stress is kind of like a um, boiling teapot. This is probably pretty old school. I don't think people use these anymore, but essentially if you guys um, had these at your homes, um, the water ends up boiling to the point where uh, you might hear a whistle. Those are like the really old school ones. And um, I like to use this analogy because <laughs> When our dogs are really stressed, um, sometimes they might start warming up. They might start steaming, just kind of like what happens with uh, the teapot. And the steaming or the, the building of heat can be a metaphor for our dog um, feeling stressed, um, feel, having more um, stress signals occurring. So as our dogs provide more stress signals, that gets um, to the point where our dog gets so stressed, they have an explosion. And this can be kind of like a bark or a lunge or sometimes even a bite for some dogs. But being able to register when the teapot is steaming is a great place to keep our dog or to, to make sure that we're doing our preemptive measures to prevent them from boiling over. Um, so even if our dogs feel stressed, if, we, if there's anything we can salvage by um, catching their stress levels before they get too high, that's a really great place to help advocate for our dogs. Let's say if we were training our dog or we run into some sort of situation that we can't get away from um, to be able to support our dog when they are stressed. Um, and, and also just recognizing what, what that really looks like is, is so important. Um, our dogs have their own independent stress signals. So the way that one dog may express their stress signals just as relaxing signals can be very independent, but learning what that looks like is, is so essential. Um, so I think a good goal is just to make sure that we're, we're, our dogs are operating in safe temperatures, right? Um, where it's not boiling hot, it's not warm, they're, they're kind of at like a nice neutral lukewarm baseline, right? And uh, when we do see some of those stress signals, that could be an, um, a way for us to make any adjustments to help meet our dog's needs. So some stress signals, um, more about stress signals. So um, the chronic stress that our dogs feel can relate to more maladaptive behaviors or more aggression that happens. So it is really important that uh, our dogs have 
not safety. <clears throat> um, they have they they have that free from from those stressors. Uh, maintaining a low FAS or low uh, fear, stress, and anxiety can be a great way to promote good animal welfare, uh, health, and training. And so these are things that are very important to to consider whenever we're we're uh, monitoring your dog stress. And the way we monitor our dog stress is to really help curve um, the stress as low as possible so we can have our dogs be at their very best. Some other stress signals can be um, the ones that you noted here, some lip flipping, some panting. Um, other things could be our dogs um, moving away from something. They're literally fleeing. Um, our dogs literally might freeze where, so, where they look like statues. Um, our dogs may be more fidgety, so they might start swiveling their head really quickly or, or being more hesitant with their body language. And also fighting can be also an, a strong uh, sense um, of, of our dogs being at a place where they're, they're so greatly impacted by an environment. So being able to note some of these things um, also let us know that if they occur in an environment that we're in, uh, to do our best to prevent that from happening and do taking those uh, progressive measures so we can monitor dog stress so they don't show these flight skills, uh, these flight behaviors or, or freezing behaviors or fidgeting behaviors. Um, so noting good stress is really helpful because it really helps us to prevent our dogs from getting to a point where they're, they're really having a bad time. And usually you'll see that again when your dogs are fleeing, when they get freeze, when they're fidgeting, or even when they actually want to fight another dog. Um, so stress signals are, are very independent on each dog and learning to read your own independent, uh, your dog's independent precursor signals or the signals that they provide before that explosion can be a really good place for us to detect when that, that, that teapot is starting to boil and, and really curving them away from that. Um, so it, it, monitoring that is a great way to be a good teammate and to advocate for them. Um, and it's a, it's a great way to keep our dogs safe and, and making sure that we're going the right way towards our training. So here are some stress signals that, I've, I, that I noted um, at a glance. And um, these can be things that uh, your dogs may express, one or two of them, or it could be a, a bunch of them. But in, in, a, in a nutshell, um, whenever our dogs are performing these stress signals, it's important to note that they can be really subtle. So I did my 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 best to really put together some key body language signals that happen at certain body parts. And just from, just from the head alone, in terms of our, our dog, uh, you can note that there can be so many of these stress signals that occur. So as a way for us to start being more savvy in detecting these signals, it is important to note that um, whenever you see any of these signals that you see um, on the screen, um, that that could be a precursor signal of our dogs um, getting to the point where they do boil over. So being able to know what that looks like from our dog, uh, from our unique dog is a really good place where if we do see that in a real life context, we have some sort of signal from our dogs to, to, to give them the support to move away or to make things more easier for them. So, and just like everything else in terms of body language, it's important to look at things as a whole. Um, look at look at um, the whole body as, of your dog in terms of where their tail carriage is, um, how loose their body is, to if there's any um, uh, pile erection on the, the their back end or or raised hairs. Um, noting what that looks like is so important. So, some one thing that is so great that we have is these phones that really do a great job of recording for us. And one thing we can do is we can go frame by frame and really start to dissect what those pieces look like. So we can be more savvy and reading our dog's body language and really curving uh, our way to success when we're thinking about um, surviving in these uh, conditions when we're going outside. So that's going to be it. Um, thank you so much. This was something that's really enjoyable for me. And um, I know that that was a little bit a lot. I I think I went a little bit over in time, but I just wanted to make sure I provide you guys as much value as I can with, with the time that we have together. So I just really appreciate everyone for being here again. Thank you so much, Sam. That is a ton of information, but you managed it right on time. So we do have some time for questions. Um, we've got some already in the chat, but if you have other questions for Sam, please go ahead and put them in there. Um, so one of the first questions is about an eight-month 
old puppy who doesn't like to be left. So it sounds like they tried to go outside on the porch, um, tried to have him with them tethered, tried to have him in the house, but able to see them, tried having the front door closed. In each case, he was really barky. Even if they tried to give a Kong, what else can we do to help him feel more comfortable when he's not with them? Right. And I think um, this is such a, a challenge that everyday pet parents face, especially with our young puppies. Um, as puppies, they they can learn very quickly, especially when we spend a lot of time with them, that that is what is safe. And something that is really helpful is to really pull back the training to make things easier again. Um, and some things that we can do is uh, we can make alone time fun. So sometimes if let's say if we leave the room, our dogs are uncomfortable, that's a really good piece that we can take away to make things more easier. So maybe let's say if our dogs are start crying when we're at when we left the room, a good place to start is having a playpen and having plenty of enrichments for our dogs to enjoy in the playpen as a, as a place to start with with all that. But um, I think before we start thinking about moving into a different room for our dogs to have a certain understanding that when they're in a certain place away from people, and that can be just a playpen with you being uh, right next to the, the playpen, that that's safe. It opens up more room for us to start um, adding more pieces, such as being further away from that playpen and eventually being on the other side of the door. So in short, usually when uh, things are not fun for our dogs, um, I think it's really important to go back to having fun with our dogs by making things simple. Um, starting off with just doing some enrichments um, in, in their crates and really gradually progressing on that um, from there. Other great skills can be teaching our dogs how to relax on a mat. Um, so being able to teach that in different conditions, right? From when your dogs are, don't, aren't in a playpen, from them being in a playpen and eventually on us on the other side of the playpen and us going through that progression is a great way to make sure that our dogs understand what happens and also register it safe um, when we do leave because they had so much practice and all that. So it goes back to skill number eight, which is really building reinforcement history. So being able to have a strong, reliable sense of safety when our dogs are interacting in that, that confinement area in that playpen and also make, coupling that off with a skill is a really good place to start. Awesome. Another question, can you provide an example for how to prevent our dog from barking at guests who come to the door? Yeah, that's a that's a great one and something that can be such a challenge. Um, one thing we can do is potentially provide our dogs um, some sort of enrichment that's away from the, the door area. Maybe this can be a different room. Um, some things that can also be helpful is um, setting up some uh, music that's playing in the background if it's something that we can plan for. Um, usually working on our dog learning a skill is probably going to be the best throwaway to do things. Um, so teaching our dogs that whenever um, guests do uh, do come over that they they offer maybe grabbing a toy toy and presenting it to you as a way to replace the behavior of, of barking. That could be a great place to start with that. Um, but if we want more of a of an easier fix, I think simply by having our dog in a different room where they're not as greatly impacted by the stress that can occur when people just suddenly come through the door uh, can help. When we go through the due diligence of also just going through the door, um, just having opportunities for our dogs to notice that whenever people that they've noticed and they, they live with come through the front door and um, and they, they get uh, treats for, for relaxing. I think that's a great place to start. So by the time we work up and have so many of these experiences, um, our dogs will have more of an understanding. Let's say someone uh, knocks on the door. Uh, I'd say um, start off with knocking on your own door and then maybe having a, a family member doing that um, would be a good place to start. Um, but maybe even before just being on the other side, just, just knocking just without being by, by a front door is a good place to start. Um, desensitizing our dogs to how they feel with the environment is a, is probably the best bet. So making sure that when they hear knocks that they know, know that that's safe and relaxing, um, that they, when they see people um, open the door, that's safe and relaxing. So the creaks can be really scary for our dogs or do I know dogs that are really stressed with sounds of doorknobs. So being able to, 
really break down the, the, the actual instance of a person coming into these little pieces, like from, from the knocking, from someone just being by the door, um, from someone standing by the door and opening it. I think if we take away uh, and teach our dogs each of those pieces, um, they'll give them more reassurance. And sometimes if they're uncomfortable, it's just signals that we might need to take some time to really work on those little pieces. Awesome. Another question. Uh, someone was out with their pup for a walk. And uh, while it's not normal, he refused treats, wouldn't make eye contact, was super hypervigilant. At that point, all we could do was get him home as soon as we could. Was there something else we could have done other than just kind of talking calmly and reassuring him as they went home? Yeah, and I think that's always a great place to to start whenever our dogs are having a difficult time. I think our dogs are always trying to do their best, just like we, we, what we are. And it's okay to have those moments where our when we're, where dog just needs comfort, needs to be away from things. Uh, but one thing that we can always take away, that we can always do to have the best foot moving forward is learning what set up those conditions and what we can do um, as, as teammates to our dogs to make sure that we're preventing that from happening uh, the next time. So even though um, there might be an, like some sort of reaction or some sort of different circumstance, uh, it, it is all information that we can use to help direct us to where we want to go moving forward. Um, but uh, do find grace in those peaks and valleys, right? Making sure that uh, whenever there's those failures, sometimes they, it happens. Um, we're learning this stuff. It's completely new for some of us and, and, it's, and it's fine for us to, um, maybe have some, some hiccups along the way. And I think that's a part of the learning and um, really coming to terms with that and not being too hard on ourselves is so important. But, but of course, um, my go-to tip would, if anything were to go around is really assessing what did the environment look like? What was the antecedent that happened before uh, my dog uh, had a meltdown, for example? And what I can do to re-engineer re or, or change in practice how I interact interact with the environment as the way to um, see more success. And I think just going back to the topic of management, um, it's something that we start temporarily. And I think over time, we can start alleviating um, sheltering our dog in the world once they build more of a skill set in, in finding reassurance. And we can do that by teaching our dogs these replacement skills. So. Um, Whenever things go wrong, it just means that there's things that we can learn from. And what you can always fall back on is the preparation you do to set your dog up for success, working on those training skills before we get into that, those phases of those, those, those challenging situations. Awesome. And then one, one quick note with that too, is just always, especially when we're dealing with behavior issues where we're seeing significant fear, significant reactivity, things like that always a good idea to find a certified behavior professional to work with. Cause there are some things where we can say in general, here's, here's what we might suggest, but there's so much that could be going into it. Sometimes we really want to be working with a veterinary behaviorist, depending on what we're seeing. So um, always a good idea to check with a professional one-on-one -on -one if you're seeing things that either seem out of sorts or that you're not able to get kind of solved um, based on, you know, the tips that Sam already talked about today. So um, thank you so much, Sam. So much information, so much new stuff for people to think about. And I love how much you've focused on that kind of grace with the peaks and valleys that is definitely really hard when you're working with reactive pups. Um, it can be hard to kind of keep yourself centered over that. So I really appreciate you focusing on that. Um, anything folks should know about where to find you, where they can keep tabs on you and see what you've been up to? Yeah, um, I am on social media. So you can check me on Instagram at Rough Roll Academy. I'm also starting a new YouTube page on Rough Roll Academy where I'll be providing more free content for people just to have more accessible information. And even though I wanted to fit as much information as possible to, to help you guys in your everyday lives with reactivity dog, with your reactive dog, just like what Miranda was mentioning, our dogs are so unique and sometimes it is important to, to speak with a professional. So with that in mind, I do want to create content that's accessible, but in a way where um, it gives us information instead of a solution, just giving us an idea of what it is that we're dealing with and things that we can do to, to have a better grasp in this. But definitely um, speaking to our professionals and our, our behavior consultants, our, our veterinary behaviors are so important, especially when we see, uh, we see 
training being more difficult than it can be. Sometimes it feel if it feels like for our reactive dogs that we're doing our best to do all. Look, San, I've I've, I've done all these nine things and I, I've 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 really tried to do my best. And sometimes I think it's important just to find grace that we might need more help than that. And I think that can be uh, that well-rounded help can come in the in the form of veterinarian behaviorists and and behavior consultants and and also your local professional certified trainers. Awesome. Thank you so much, San, for being here tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you everyone for coming out and we will see you soon. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Okay. Bye. Good night.